Welcome to Under the Skin with me, Russell Brand, and Charles Eisenstein. Charles, I've wanted to speak to you for a while because I read Sacred Economics at the time that I myself was writing a book called Revolution. And it was a book that was mostly about passion and feeling and love and a sense of injustice. And it's very difficult to find ways of... Because the first thing that happens when you say change the world is people say, what's going to replace these systems that have organically evolved or evolved as a result of so much human endeavor what better ideas have you got and i remember thinking in sacred economics your is that was that your first book um wasn't my first book but defining was a book it was a book that you wrote yeah but i remember thinking there's ideas in here that are real alternatives Mm -hmm. can you talk us through uh, to refresh my memory and to perhaps illuminate our listeners, uh, some of the themes and ideas that defined sacred economics. Yeah. So I'll just maybe even take a step back and say that I did present some ideas that would f- would fill the, the expectation that you were talking about, about, okay, well, what's going to replace it? So I kind of said, okay, this could replace it, this, 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 and and here's how it would work, and here's why it's not just some idealistic fantasy, but it could actually be practical. I went into a lot of nitty-gritty economics, and still, it was unsatisfying to me because, I mean, I think that the, the solutions are out there already and have been for a long time, and that the problem that we face today is not that we do not know the solutions. We know the solutions, but we don't know how to get there. And... I in the book I outlined some ways that I think that a transition could happen to I mean I'll mention a couple of the solutions negative interest economics degrowth economics um, universal basic income um, infusing the spirit of gift into the money world which doesn't mean just um, changing our attitudes about money as if it were some neutral energy but to embody the changed attitudes in the structure of money itself, which really means the structure of capitalism. And and this is one of the false debates that run our society, say capitalism versus socialism, but, but what capitalism is depends on what capital is. And capital, money and property is nothing but an agreement among human beings that is guided by the story that we tell ourselves about who we are and what the world is. So that's the level that I'm primarily interested in. What do you mean that money or capital and property are just an agreement? That seems like a very challenging idea. People would say that money is a sort of a universally accepted form of transaction and that property is quantifiable, definable. How would you challenge such a, a rudimentary ideas? Well, they're not attached to you. The money is just bits in computers. And they only have power because of a social agreement that takes form in laws and and uh, economic structures. Uh, but it's just an agreement. And if the agreement changes, as happens sometimes, people lose faith in the money, then it becomes worthless overnight. The, and we realize, oh, it was nothing but symbols after all. Are there examples of that occurring that help us to understand that point i mean it's kind of happening in um venezuela argentina uh, with hyperinflation that's one way of the story falling apart the u.s dollar though is also subject to the same kind of story that involves global acceptance of u.s hegemony uh, the petrodollar uh, the perception that this is a stable and valuable thing a symbol really conventional economics or capitalism as we understand it then you say is a faith-based system it one component takes place in our own consciousness in the form of our belief that it Mm -hmm. is real and valid yeah and it fits into deeper stories deeper mythologies such as the mythology that says who you are is a separate self in a world of other an individual if you accept that then you automatically accept as a matter of logic that more for me is less for you. So starting with that 
concept of separation, we have competition, we have scarcity, because that universe outside of ourselves is limited. More for you is less for me. And we have a program of control, because if the world outside of ourselves is separate from ourselves, and it's, it's just a bunch of stuff out there, then your well-being comes through dominating the, the and insulating yourself from the arbitrary forces of nature and outcompeting those competitors. That's fascinating. And possibly, Charles, the reason it's so challenging to even to momentarily have a different perspective on those ideas is because they must be very, very deep in our shared memory. I mm -hmm. mean, I was thinking then that even at the time of hunting and perhaps when we were hunters and gatherers, we'd have had a sort of a concept of ourselves as symbiotically in alignment with nature. But as soon as you have the advent of agriculture, the, the human being establishes dominion over nature to one degree or another. So this is sort of, you know, not pre-civilization because it sort of is the advent of civilization, but sort of it's very difficult to uh, to bifurcate that idea of dominion over otherness from our sense of humanity almost. I mean, what example of humanity do we have that isn't already post that transition? Yeah, I mean, at least we have no example of, of mass society that is post that transition. So if we are to make the transition that, that, for example, climate change and the other crises are inviting us into, we're really needing to step into a different kind of civilization. It's not some, uh, it's not a revolution in the sense that the industrial revolution was or the information revolution. Those were intensifications of something that, as you were saying, goes way, way back to the dawn of agriculture. It's a qualitatively different thing. And we don't know how to do that. Like I want people, the first step I think into making the transition into a more beautiful world or a more alive world is to is to admit that we have no clue how to do it. Because at least then we're not gonna pursue false solutions based on thinking we know what to do. Charles, did it seem to you very challenging to invite people into a, <clears throat> a space where we are abandoning the structures that to one degree or another make us safe, even if it's safe in the arms of tyranny, with the admission that we don't know what will follow it? You do it. <laughs> I saw you one time. <laughs> oh, really? I've only watched, watched you a couple times, um, but I saw you on a podcast or on a, uh, maybe it was a truce or something with uh, members of the Westboro Baptist Church. Ah, yes. And they were, I mean, they were as extreme as you could imagine. They were carrying, I can't remember, they, they walked into the studio with signs like, you know, God hates fags and Russell Brand is a fag lover or something like that. Like, I mean, they were hardcore. And by the end, you had them laughing with you. And the you didn't say it out loud, but but what I picked up from it was, was come on guys you don't really believe this stuff do you you know like they were like they were like they didn't say it explicitly but they were like yeah you're right you know we're just human together so you reached a humanity that was underneath the ideology um that came from a real love of people and i think that ultimately it, whether we're you know social activists or environmentalists we have to touch that part of people Yes. That want the same thing we want. Yes. And to be able to see somebody and say, I know you. I know who you really are. You want to love and cherish and protect women, not abuse them. You want to take care of life on earth. I know that, even if you don't know that. And I'm going to hold that, not just for you as an individual, but as a new story of the world that we can invite people into and build a society on. You're right about that. Sadly, in history, the people who have been best at doing that are people like Hitler that, that are, re are able to reach beyond the facade of our individual mm -hmm. constructed identity to the essential truth that lays dormant or not necessarily dormant but perhaps I well, know undiscovered somehow within all of us I, I agree with that um Charles uh now there was a moment where you did a list of uh 
alternative financial ideas. Now, I mm-hmm. recognise that where you're going when it comes to um, making economic change, economics meaning just the sort of distribution of resources and the manner in which we organise our societies, uh, that, that that necessarily has to come from a fundamental shift in our perspective, a change in our consciousness. Perhaps perspective is a less scary word than mm-hmm. consciousness. So we just have to change our perspective on the world. But you did a list of things, negative interest, gift economies, universal basic income. Think about now, the first time I heard that term was, I think, in your book, and that's sort of a more popularly discussed idea in the dark web that I sometimes inhabit these days. Um, can you break down for me so that all of those ideas just so that we understand them? Sure. Um, <clears throat> they all come from the question, how do we bring the spirit of gift into the money system? What Which, is spirit of gift? So the spirit of money as we know it is about accumulation and control. The spirit of gift is the opposite. In gift culture, you do not hoard resources. You are generous because you have seen your entire life that security and and generosity go hand in hand. That the, that the most generous person, if you give and give and give, people will take care of you too. So how do you bring that into a money system? In a gift culture, you don't do, so you do not hoard uh, resources because that would be stupid. You don't get any benefit from hoarding things you don't even need right now. Much better to give them to somebody else. And then when you are in need, then they'll take care of you too, even from like a and it's not like so calculating, but that's the economic logic underneath it. So one thing, so negative interest basically is a way to uh, discourage hoarding and and encourage flow. Like if you have a billion dollars and you know that it's going to be subject to, say, a negative 5% interest rate, you'd be happy to lend it out at zero interest because if you keep it, it's going to shrink. It obeys the law of decay or the law of return in nature and in ecosystems like that. Beings do not hoard resources. Everything rots and returns to the soil. Mm. So if we have money Mm. that does not rot, but instead just grows, is preserved endlessly. Why do you think we elected not to emulate the natural erosion of resources in our economic systems but chose instead to invert it and have an interest model that's about growth and accumulation how do you think that happened but particularly when usury and like the idea of mm-hmm. lending interest is sort of contraband in a lot of religious ideologies probably all of them i don't know i've not done the research yeah yeah i mean these religious um leaders they or wisdom keepers they understood that that interest will tear people apart and create competition so they banned it within the tribe. In Judaism, it was banned within the tribe. And then when the Christian and Islamic teachers came and said the tribe includes everybody, then the, the ban became universal. So the, the growth of the money system as we know it has, I mean, that's a history lesson that, that I'm not going to try to deliver right now. But what I can say is that it fit in with a much larger ideology and mythology of separation, of domination, of control. It was well at home in that, in separation from nature. Yes. So now we are are hopefully transitioning to a different relationship to each other and a different relationship to nature. And the the legacy money system doesn't fit in to where our hearts want to take us, to the knowledge of my brother, what happens to you is happening to me. What happens to the rainforest is happening to me, not because I can necessarily draw a causal link to my self-interest. Like, and this is one of the flaws of environmental rhetoric today. They say, why should we care about the rainforest? Well, if we don't, bad things will happen to us. But it didn't used to be like that in the days of save the whales. It wasn't like, let's save the whales, otherwise bad things will happen to us. It was because they're so beautiful. Because if the whales go extinct, something in me dies. Even if I can still survive, even if I can still buy a Big Mac for five five dollars and and pay the rent, et cetera, et cetera, something in me 
withers when life on earth is depleted. And so the I think what we need to invite people into is into a revolution of life, into service for life, even if, yeah, I mean, so I think a lot of the, the um, environmental logic is counterproductive. Because actually it's, it's uh, mimicking the systems exactly. that it's opposing structurally. Don't do, if you do yeah. X, you will accrue this benefit. Right. You will profit in this manner. Right. The subtext is make decisions based on what is going to accrue to your rational self-interest. Whereas your entire, like, so you're like, I don't want to get there too soon because I don't want to, like, because it seems once we're into this, we're, we're in some sort of metaphysical territory. But it, you would say that the decision happens at the level of the way we view otherness, or that we are one. The, the The relationship between the individual and the external world is one that needs to be challenged. Yeah, I mean, you can make a whole metaphysical apparatus out of it, but for a lot of people, the entree is much more experiential. Go on. Um, you have a mystical experience of oneness with, it could be through um, plant medicines or it could be through some um, spiritual practice where you feel as, as a, a lived reality, your non-separation with some other beings. Yes. And then maybe you want to build a metaphysics on top of that. But I don't think that's how we reach most people. Um, Usually the metaphysics is more of um, giving the rational mind permission to believe what experience is showing me. Yeah, what, you're right. Yeah, It's like the rational mind needs a route, a logical route to understanding a, 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 a separate framework or a transcendent framework. So we need to invent a category that yeah. gives us access to that. I'm very really interested in what you say, Charles, about emulating systems that seem to occur naturally whether it's the idea of uh, atrophy that you just discussed within economics or i wonder is that a recurrent theme in your work of looking for what appears inherent and whether or not our external administrative and managerial systems can in some way emulate that maybe it's maybe it's just a choice of what we want to participate in I believe that our stories are intimately, intimately related to the reality that we experience. So for example, if we carry a story that the earth is a bunch of instrumental stuff, a bunch of resources for us to dispose with, but not alive, not conscious, not intelligent, then from that story, we will treat earth as a bunch of stuff, not alive. In other words, we hold a story that the earth is dead, we kill the earth. We hold a story that the earth is alive and sacred, then we will build a world that is alive and sacred to us. That's why I like working on the level of story and not mm -hmm. just intellectually, but also how do we give each other an experience of life and sacredness? In, in every way, in everything we do, in every re interaction that we have, like to remember that, then we, be, we become participants in that story and that reality. And that is a link between traditional environmental activism and things that from like the climate change perspective couldn't possibly do any good. Like what if what, if what your love and care calls you for, calls you to is to work with prisoners or work with homeless people or to, to try to uh, preserve or recover dying languages. What's the carbon footprint of that? Nothing. So from that perspective, and I've had environmentalists tell me that, like they're like, Charles, you're wasting your time by expanding the conversation this big. We gotta cut emissions by this amount within this window, otherwise nothing else matters. And that, that mindset of here's the one important thing to which we must sacrifice everything else that's part of the problem. Where do we get that idea that there's one important thing to which we must sacrifice everything else? Money. If only you had enough money, you could solve all your problems. So, oh God. 
you or know, God. A monotheistic yep. God. Because I was trying to wonder, at what point is the distinction occurring between sort of a living, vibrant Earth, which we participate in psychically, spiritually, and totally, and the Earth as a resource? And I wondered if that, I wonder if that occurs in the transition from pantheonism, paganism, to monotheism, which is like the, where the, mm-hmm. uh, the sort of sacred endowment of plants, animals, etc., becomes these things are, as you say, instrumental. Yeah. Do you think that's a significant I think, shift? I think it's both a cause of this shift and a symptom of the shift. Like the more distance we are from nature, the more it seems that God is not in nature, but is kind of the external overseer of nature. Mm. And and actual beings of nature lose their beingness. A lot of the things that we blame as cause are actually symptom. How do you mean? What do you mean by that? I mean, I'm seeing it a lot in... In climate change and environmentalism now, um, I hope it's okay to keep referring back to that because my mind is kind of in that space. But that, um, for example, one of the most alarming things happening is what I'm calling the insect holocaust. Have you noticed that there's less bug splatter on the window than when you were a kid? Yeah, loads less. It used to be yeah. a, a good covering of splatter, right. like a nice sort of a Steven Spielberg sky of <laughs> splatter. Yeah. yeah. It's not your imagination. Like there's been a, approximately a 75% loss of flying insect biomass over 30 years. So confronted with anything like that or forest fires or hurricanes, <clears throat> this mindset of fundamentalism, um, of money, of war has us jump. <clears throat> excuse me. Have some water from this little beaker. Thank you. It has us jump to the cause. What's the cause? Oh, insect die off, it must be climate change. Forest fires, it must be climate change. Um, to, to find an enemy is one of the deep programs of our culture. To solve a problem, like, I, like so my son, who's five, got this book from the library about superheroes. And it has all these little anecdotes about the Avengers or something like that. Uh, and each story in there the template was the same. A bad thing is happening. The cause is a bad guy. And the solution is to defeat the bad guy by force. (laughs) So this this is an example of a reductionism that also has us reduce the living complexity of Earth to a, a single cause, which is why I'm wary of putting all of the environmental eggs into the basket of climate change and saying, if we only solve this one thing, then everything else will be fine. And then what do we not see in that reductionism? Reductionism always leaves things out. And Mm. in this case, it leaves out the repeated dousing of the entire landscape with pesticides over the last 90 years. It leaves out habitat destruction. It Mm. it leaves out deforestation, which one thing that came out of my my research for this book is that, that deforestation and land abuse is a much bigger cause of the flood drought cycle, forest fires, and other things than greenhouse gases. What advantage does the climate change narrative give the powerful that is not in the deforestation and habitat destruction narrative in order for the climate change narrative to be favored? It lends itself to quantitative solutions that you can make money off of. <laughs> it's always that. <laughs> Quantitative. What, uh, can you explain yeah. what you mean by well, that? Well, you know, if it becomes a matter of, of say, increase, increasing carbon sequestration, then you can plant biofuels plantations across Africa, Asia, and South America, which is happening, that the numbers look good, the metrics look good, but what's happening on the ground is subsistence peasants are being forced out of their traditional lifestyles, Um, pristine ecosystems are being leveled to plant fast-growing trees, Uh, communal land holdings are being converted into titled property, Um, indigenous people are getting evicted from their land, like when things get monetized and reduced to a number, the things that you cannot reduce to a number get left out. So the in general, the when we quantify things, they fit into a society that is built on measurement and quantification and ultimately the conversion of all things to the number called value. It's dangerous. And I, I mean, I could go on and on. I met Al Gore and he was talking, as you might imagine, about environmentalism and climate change. While 
I was meeting him, I felt this feeling of deep frustration. Uh, and not that Al Gore might not be a nice guy, because I saw a documentary about him once, and I saw his <laughs> cabin, and I thought he did seem like a nice guy in his cabin with pictures of his dad up and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, human. And uh, But what I felt was that everything he was saying was invisibly caveated with the phrase, unless it affects the interests of the powerful. We must do something about carbon mm -hmm. emissions unless it affects the interests of the powerful. Then we won't do anything. We must do something unless it, you know, energy consumption unless it affects the interests of the powerful. This thing that I instinctively felt it, it feels like it maybe relates to mm -hmm. what you just said, and maybe you have even more information on that. Yeah, I feel a little suspicious of the dominant climate change narrative because the powerful are so willing to accept it. I think it's a lot less disruptive than the alternative narrative that I like to work with, which is the living earth narrative, which says that that earth is alive, that its health depends on the health of its organs and tissues. And what are those? Those are the forests, the wetlands, the seagrass meadows, the mangroves, the elephants, the whales, the fish, the corals, everything that is destroyed by development is necessary. If you are in the carbon mind fr frame, then even if you value a forest for its carbon storage and sequestration, once you've reduced it to that number, you could cut it down if there's, say, gold to mine underneath it or oil and plant another forest somewhere else to make up for it. Because it's just the numbers, right? Or you could cut it down, but install lots of solar panels to offset that, that carbon. We're not treating Earth as alive and, and precious and sacred by operating in that quantitative mindset. And I don't think that's a big enough revolution. I don't think that's, we, we are being initiated into a new kind of relationship to Earth, not initiated into, let's be a little bit more clever in working the numbers. <laughs> yes, yes, I think you're right. It's um, it's challenging to imagine such a transition taking place other than exper experientially. I'm thinking now of there was a time, of course, when the natural relationship to earth and resources was a sacred one, where there was an accepted symbiosis between that which we consume and ourselves, an acceptance of the oneness. Uh, progress inverted commas has led us to where we are now where uh, where we regard the earth and in fact perhaps all relationships as kind of commodities in some way you know perhaps you're encouraged to look at you know perhaps the phrase networking even mm -hmm. refers to our relationships with one another are commodities mm -hmm. which so without people having hmm, a kind of personal epiphany or some kind of experience some transitional change of perspective brought about by as you've already mentioned uh, like a, an encounter with plant medicines which from a glance at you it looks like you have about every couple of days you look like you're <laughs> scurrying off to a cauldron full of wonder or a blast into some Actually, substrata very 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 rare for me very rare yeah was it tra was that were your experiences with uh uh, psychedelics significant in your uh, perspective and your worldview? Yeah, um, I didn't want to interrupt your thought, but... Um, Go on, what was my thought? Because I think we can jump into that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, but yes, um, I had a profound LSD trip when I was 22 that <clears throat> coincided with other revelations that the reality that I had been inhabiting was narrower mm -hmm. than what is real. Mm. Um, and so that was, that was, and it wasn't just that experience. It was also living in Taiwan. Um, I lived in Taiwan at the time and, and came into contact with Taoism and Chinese medicine and, and things that, I mean, I went to Yale University and I oh. thought I knew, I thought I knew what was like real. You're like a conventionally educated, clever person. Yeah. You're I not started, like some <laughs> fruitcake off the street staring out into space saying the insects there's been an armageddon maybe, maybe i am a free cake <laughs> and and i just got the yale degree to disguise myself <laughs> brilliant so yeah i studied math philosophy you know i thought i knew how the world worked and i would ridicule anyone who who um didn't believe in i guess you could call it 
uh, rational materialism. But then I was in Taiwan and, and I experienced things that were just blatantly contradicting what I thought was real. So I thought, OK, if this thing that I've been told isn't true, what else have I been told is not true? What were the things you experienced in Taiwan that challenged your of rational materialism? Oh, uh, well, experiences with with Qigong, uh, with with uh, energy in the body. What do you mean? Real experiences? Yeah. Like I, I saw this Qigong teacher. Um, Qigong was, is like working with energy. Sort of yeah. Like a... Yeah. And this is just one of many, many experiences. You know, by itself, it might not have totally turned me inside out. But, you know, I went to see this guy and he's like, yeah, here's. And my friend said, do you know, do you do you do, you do acupuncture? And he said, oh, yes, I do. But I don't use needles. And then he just takes his fingers, you know, and he like, like kind of pokes at my arm. And I mean, I felt something mm. uh, obvious. And it wasn't that I was this credulous seeker. You know, I was going in there with, with skepticism. And then he said, and now I will open your channels. And he tapped us in a few places and walked out of the room. And we were pouring sweat within seconds. And... Like, how do I fit that into my reality? Yes, because like yeah. now you arrive here, you and your accomplice, and you look, you know, you're wearing your jumper, which we now know is your mum's jumper. You look like, not credulous, because that's potentially a pejorative term, but you look like someone, you've got the brightness of eye, you're talking about sacred economics. You look like somebody who, you know, there seems that there is a division. You know, there is a division in our culture. Mm -hmm. There's people that sort of optimistically believe we should change system, the systems that uh, support the powerful and that it's possible to change those systems. And then there are people that say, use lot are hippies or you're naive, you've not thought things through. But you're saying that you come from a background where you've sort of studied con conventional philosophy. I, I attempt economics. to bridge that, that gulf. You know, sacred economics, you've read it, it has a lot of stuff about liquidity preference versus time preference and Keynesian versus Austrian economics. And like I get into nitty gritty economic theory in there, but underlying it is what you might call a spiritual understanding, but I would call the understanding of the mythology underneath our logic and saying, look how that is embedded or embodied in our systems. And what would a system look like that embodies a different mythology, the mythology of interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh says? What would that look like in actual, like translated into actual systems? What would that look like? Yes. That's, that's um, an important question to ask, even if we don't have an answer to begin with. But I find that it unifies a lot of the seemingly disparate um, alternatives like, for example, regenerative agriculture. What would agriculture look like if we understood that the well-being of the soil is our well-being? What would that look like? And then all kinds of practices emanate from that question that are not a merely a matter of, of this kind of technical engineering of soil to be more productive, but it's saying treat the soil as a being and see what happens. Because if we are not separate from the world, then the flourishing of life in soil or in anywhere will f will make life flourish among us and with us. Yes. Do you think on some level human beings perhaps have an acceptance of this oneness? That earlier in our conversation, we talked about perhaps the potential to charismatically reach within and say, I know you, I know actual you, that this isn't real you. And and, and possibly all of us will somewhere within that, um, within that aspect of ourselves recognize that uh, the soil is part of us and the tree is mm -hmm. part of us and the light and there is no separation and etc. Uh, when I... Uh, listen to you and I imagine uh, bringing that state I I into being it feels like there will be there's some quite uh, power, uh, sort of what do I want to say sort of solid reluctance I'm not talking about my own part it's which I imagine evangelizing to you know I live near farmers and mm -hmm. I imagine sort of saying think of this soil as a living thing now like we might unconsciously do stuff like that you know what is it to have a green thumb you know some people are good with plants you know like so um, we may unconsciously recognize that but do you feel that that's 
But it's a big thing to ask of people to change from this individualistic perspective. You're saying that's what we currently have. We regard ourselves as individuals and all else as separate, potentially as resources or threats. Or mm-hmm. to Transitioning to a state where we see, where we practice the, the external world being at one with us, into being, it feels like a big challenge. I don't think it's usually necessary to get people to intellectually accept that as a metaphysical premise. It's just necessary to give them an experience of of connecting to soil or something as a being. How? There's a million ways. Um, it depends who it is. Depends on the circumstances. Um, I mean, if it were a farmer here, you know, I wouldn't try to do it myself. I would have Gabe Brown or or Who's Ernst that? Gosh or are they? these are these are some like permaculture slash regenerative agriculture geniuses who are farmers who have been doing it for years who speak the language um, who can point to the magical results that come from their practices that that and and when they when they and I guess if I mean if I were doing it I would I would talk about that I'd be like look what happens to this land when it comes back alive again. Don't you want that for your land? Don't you want springs that have been dry for 30 years that your grandfather told you about to start flowing again? Don't you want the songbirds to come back? Like that can happen. Your land can come alive and your livelihood will improve. Hmm. You know, like it's not that you're necessarily, but it's gonna require changing a lot of habits and letting go of a lot of things that you thought you knew that's the the guardian at the threshold that has to be placated with a offering like an offering for for many people me too you too is often to place at that altar the possession of thinking that you knew how to do it thinking that you've been right all along thinking that you have the answer thinking that you're the good guy like there's always an offering that needs to be made for us to inhabit a higher level of effectiveness and joy. Why do you think that is? Because what we're offering up was part of a maintaining of a state of being that is not consistent with where we want to go. Mm, mm. So yeah, we have to jettison that. Mm, yes. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, from a personal perspective, I can identify with that uh, because of the numerous times in my life when I've had to amend destructive habits and the journey has always required as its ignition or instigation a surrender it's always Mm -hmm. required a kind of death oh this person is dead now Mm -hmm. then it needs hope that there is a possibility of uh, Mm -hmm. uh, another way then it requires willingness to ask for help the humility that's sort of the formula for you know a a 12-step therapy right from addiction admit powerlessness believe it's possible mm-hmm. to change ask for help that's the sort of continuum that's sort of perennially applicable in, absolutely in my experiences and you think that that acquires it with something as subtle as shifts of consciousness mm-hmm. or changing your behavior i like that you say it doesn't have to be sort of or less- changing of systems systems you know like a lot of to go back to the environmental topic you often hear the phrase addicted to oil addicted to fossil fuels addicted to consumption and it's used in disparaging tones as if we as if we could shame people into ceasing their addiction well you've been addicted before how well does that work (laughs) you know to say shame on you russell you know you you've you better lock those bottles away and not touch them otherwise bad things are going to happen to you that doesn't work that makes it worse it makes it worse. So if we take the metaphor seriously, okay, we're addicted to oil. Why? What is the unmet need driving the addiction? Why all this ridiculous consumption that doesn't even hmm. serve human needs? What must it be? Fear? Power? What is it? You think it is the unconscious drive? I think it's, drive? Um, I think it's from disconnection. Disconnection is the mm-hmm. problem. Like, why would someone accumulate millions and millions of dollars or pounds, et cetera, that they don't actually need, except that it gives them a feeling of security and belonging? If they were, if they had a full complement of intimate relations to community and to nature, 
They wouldn't even want that. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of saying that to some uh, CEOs of energy giants. If you had a full complement of relationships to other human beings and to nature, I don't think you'd be pushing so hard. For that's this not what bill. you'd say. <laughs> I mean, it might be fun, but what you could say is, I know that you actually don't want this. I know that your wealth isn't making you happy. Hmm. And, and if you say that in a spirit of alliance and from the spirit of, I want you to be happier. I love you. And I feel bad that you're, you're futilely meeting, trying to meet your need for <laughs> intimacy. <laughs> Man, my brother. Bad for you know? you. You're futilely trying yeah. to meet your need. Because I'm like, yeah. I don't know if this is an example of my own ongoing naivety, but when I'm having these conversations, I'm continually thinking, in, in my mind all the time, how are we going to do it? That's the, the thought that's never gone away. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do it? How is it going to happen? What are we going to do? When's it going to be? Which bits do you know how to do? Yeah. There's a few bits that I think I'm able to do. That's my ongoing inner monologue, which is usually interchangeable with delusional mental illness, which is an unfortunate component that I've noticed. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's relatively yeah. common. But you have such a good heart, you know, like even as that mental dialogue is going, you're also, I mean, this is just my, my intuition. You help people, maybe it's through humor, I don't know, but you help people, like you have a love for people that is infectious and it helps people love themselves more. Oh, good, thanks. And the changes that come from that are so much more powerful than from these bits of information of, okay, here's how you do it, here's how you do it. It's not that those are useless and not worth thinking about, but if they don't have the engine of, of love, of acceptance of oneself as a loving, caring being, then they are useless. You're entirely yeah. correct about uh, this. In fact, I because part of my own ongoing recovery from substance misuse is to spend time around other people that continue to experience it. And the you know the the, the point of uh, entry, the aperture where I know I will get access is firstly what I tell them is I feel worthless and I'm not lovable and if people really knew me they wouldn't love me and mm. that and that's why I had to drink and take drugs however by using this method these feelings have changed it's still I still experience those feelings but to a lesser degree and I'm here to tell you that you don't need to feel that anymore and that uh, seems like on this interpersonal level specifically with the issue of you know addiction which can be a both connection and attachment to mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of negative solutions seems to be successful i feel that there is something in this and listening to you now it feels like that that's that idea is being uh, verified but at this time where global dissatisfaction or at least our awareness of it seems uh, to be sort of spiking and all encompassing how do we make these stories seem viable? What is the entry point? So many people that I talk to that are sort of meant to be avant-garde, vanguard right there at the front line. Mm -hmm. what, they, what they are saying breaks down to, so basically leave things as they fucking are, or it could be a lot worse. Like you know, proper, in, you know, sort of highly regarded public intellectuals. What I listen and the distilled down is mm -hmm. things ain't that bad, just keep still and i start yeah. to think that possibly the success is somewhat predicated on right. that conclusion yeah you get rewarded for for delivering that message <laughs> the, the the status quo rewards you for helping maintain itself and I, so i think that it it's an important data point for people to to know that things are not okay that like we have to take in the full range of data points if we're going to be in reality part of that range is the horrible things that are happening on this planet right now. The Hazda getting extinguished from their last remaining hunter, hunting and gathering habitat. The, the environmental activists in Guatemala who are getting intimidated by paramilitaries who like kidnap their children and torture them. Like the worst things you can imagine are happening right now on this earth to people, to places, to, to forests, to whales. And we have to take those data points in, otherwise we are not in reality. And we also have to take in the data points of the miracles, the things that do not fit into consensus reality in the other direction. Like consensus reality is very narrow. It doesn't include the worst, it doesn't include the best. 
It doesn't include spontaneous remission from stage four cancer uh, using alternative modalities. It doesn't include the, the I mean, I, I hesitate to name some of the things that I know exist because then you are going to think that I'm a credulous new age kook. But come on, we can have some credulous new age kookery in the podcast. You said that thing about liquidity and economics a minute ago, and right. I think that's purchased you a little bit of territory okay. for some proper kookery. Now, let's hear Charles Einstein's, Einstein's <laughs> crackpot theories about lovely, fluffy old world <laughs> and its cuddly solutions. Tell us some of them things. Yeah, I like I them. Mean, I mean, so... you did the bloody poor Guatemalans get him nutted off. You did the terrible that poor tribe that have just lost their land so we do need some of the positive stuff yeah i mean so you know i run across people who who invent free energy devices um or who uh develop ways to to heal cancer uh or um to uh, just basically um to purify polluted water, like well, to do this in, yeah. sort of, in a sort of qigong way, in a sort of a yeah, a, like that kind of manipulation stuff. of energy. I keep, yeah. I don't know why I'm drawn at the moment to numerous stories about suppressed pa patents for new right. energy. There's resources. that whole universe of that's a thing, yeah. isn't it? That's the yeah, world. Yeah. Do you think that's real? Um, you know, uh, let me get to that right after I just finished this other thought of of to, to we have to bring in those things too. Otherwise, we, we will be in despair. If you only take the mainstream and the horrible things, yes. but you think that change can only happen according to the scientific materialism that we've inherited, then you will be in despair because that theory of change says that change happens when you exert a force on something, yes. that the universe runs by force. Mm -hmm. But who has more force, us or the military industrial complex? with the media control and the financial institutions. They have more force. So if, if, if our hope for change depends on overcoming them, overpowering them, forget it. What we need is a miracle, which means something that is impossible from an old story and possible in a new story. That's what a miracle is. It doesn't mean that some supernatural being intercedes. It means something that our version of reality was too narrow to encompass, but then it happens. And we receive that and we're like, oh, maybe reality isn't what I thought it was. Maybe my hopelessness is based on false premises. That's very interesting, Charles. Mm -hmm. I mean, like uh, when you sort of talk about scientific materialism and then you sort of say that there could be the interceding of the yeah. events that don't fit within our previous understanding I'm of reality. Actually, I'm actually a materialist in a way. I just think that matter has properties that we have exported onto spirit but but it's not that there's some that matters just matter tell me more about this it's matter not, has properties that we have exported onto spirit like yeah. if we had the lens if we had the means for analysis we would see that matter has properties that are right. yet to be included in our understanding right. of reality right intelligence purpose in fact where would the distinction be in like right. according to your own totalitarian or totalistic world view matter consciousness in fact even in you know like a more objective like not that i'm saying you're not objective of course uh version of reality how would there ever be a distinction how would there right. ever be a line between consciousness and matter where would that line be drawn right. or spirit and matter right those categories are already a symptom of the desacralization of matter so as for like, so you also asked like, you know, what about this like conspiracy stuff? Like, is it real or not? Are free energy devices real, but suppressed by the energy companies mm -hmm. and Nikola Tesla's inventions and the FBI came in and burned his papers, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, like yes, all, that all stuff. of this. I like this. Yeah. Um, this is a, an example of asking the wrong question. The question, is it real or not? Leads you down a rabbit hole. If you start investigating it, you find all kinds of weird stuff. And the objective mind wants to say, okay, this is true and that's not. But what I think is that, say, just to take free energy devices, which in case the people inside this microphone don't know, they are technologies to produce electrical energy without fuel in seeming violation of the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> uh, and, and so, the reality in which these devices fit is a reality where people have um, 
and acceptance of the fundamental generosity and abundance of the universe. That's the psychic climate in which they can be real. Because the psychic climate is one of scarcity, they cannot fit into consensus reality. They have to stay on the margins and they will stay on the margins until humanity, the bulk of humanity goes undergoes a shift in consciousness to a perception of reality that can encompass them, that can accept them and bring them in. Mm -hmm. And that's good that they cannot come in right now because if they did, what would we use them for? Bombs. Bombs. That's what happened the <laughs> last time we got bomb factory uh, that I'm working that's on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're being protected in a way um, by our own limitations. We're being protected by our own limitations. So our perception of reality, our conscious construction of the external world, not is not only like an eye looking at reality, but it's like a pen writing reality, that reality is being created by its relationship with human consciousness. I like this kind of sort of shamanic idea that you just divulge that we can travel between planes of consciousness, perhaps through sort of spiritual practices or sort of plant medicine experiences, and not only come back saying, oh, wow, everything's all lovely and connected and kindness is the answer, which hopefully we'll all pick up over the next few years, but also that there are systems that are somehow imbued with the inherent qualities that nature has that will allow us to act in alliance and alignment with the ecosystems of which we are part. Yep. That's my answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to take drugs anymore, of course, Charles. I spoiled it. But I'm very uh, keen to have a sort of psychedelic experience. I mean, I sort of I feel it anyway. I feel it anyway. Yeah feel it anyway but i just would like to see some of the colors and some of the beings well you know you can do like kundalini yoga or something like that and get some pretty intense experiences what sort of stuff do yeah. you do then do you do some kundalini yoga and have yeah some i do some kundalini yoga um i was doing a qigong practice until i moved away from where my teacher was uh, there's a ton of stuff out there do you like to have daily experiences where you've I feel like you have a connection with a different type of consciousness that is not deterred because I feel like most people don't you I don't know because I'm not most people but I feel like we're encouraged to spend our this uh, relationship uh, if you say the true dichotomy is between individualism and interbeing then the entire culture is predicated on uh, inculcating then um, uh, cementing and guarding this state of individualism I think just on an experiential level of when I was a kid and you know you like my mates that I would hang out when I was, with when I was about 18 you sort of hang out maybe you see, even if you're smoking weed you have a chat that seems alright yeah. and then you're in a car and you're listening to mm -hmm. the radio then you go to a place and you do stuff there's never really room for these car you know when you talk about um, new possibilities will enter the matrix of our current mm -hmm. understanding when we are willing or able to accommodate them it seems that it's difficult to find time space uh, rituals and structures to accommodate that. So part of the way I, that I understand that is that, you know, this reality, this these structures of normal society, it exists. It wants to change, but it can't change from within itself. So it sends emissaries into other realities that then bring back information that you could say homo homeopathically begin to change the system that we were born in. So it's not your purpose to, at this point in time, to permanently stay in the ritual space or the psychedelic space or the mystical space. Someone needs to come back and, and change the existing system from within starting at the deepest level of consciousness so that causes the the structures to hollow out from the inside and this has been happening for a long time How, what, what do you mean give me examples of that um, it means that even the elites no longer believe their own ideologies they, they they don't believe in the system no one believes in it it's this hollow shell that looks really impressive from the outside it's more encrusted and, and harder than it ever has been. But underneath, no one believes in it anymore. It's the emperor's new clothes. It, it, it looks, everyone pretends to believe, but no one actually believes. Everyone 
discounts anything that, like you look at the talking heads talking about the threat from Iran, you know, the threat from Russia. In the in the fifties, they believed that Russia was a threat, but they don't believe it now. They are are. I mean, maybe I'm generalizing. Maybe some of them believe it, but mostly it looks to me like a posture of belief. So the ideological core of our systems is hollowing out. And one reason that it's hollowing out is that people are going out there and having experiences that blatantly contradict what they've been told is real. A lot of people, maybe, and there've been waves, you know, there was the wave of the 60s and 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 then the kind of psychonauts of the 80s when, when there was kind of a resurgence of that. And, and more and more people, though, are having this kind of experience. It could be, it doesn't have to be through drugs, you know, it could be through through spiritual practices, it could be through music, um, tantra. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to access these realities that are becoming more, these alternate realities or these larger realities that are becoming more and more available to more and more people so that everyone's still stuck in the money system that we've inherited in the system of property and the political system, but it doesn't resonate with the consciousness that's been changing. And that makes it very fragile. So I see, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, maybe I'm just deluding myself and, and, um, it feels like it yeah. might be the establishment of a s smaller or or of a, a culture or a society or a system that lives in accordance with these principles and then see what happens. Doesn't it feel like that might be <clears throat> yeah. part of it? Uh, yeah, that, that is part of it. And that, that's happening as well. Where is that happening? Eco villages, things mm. like that. Um, yeah, intentional communities. Do you intentional communities? Do you think if there are some successful examples of that, everyone in them will be killed? No, because the threat is not a direct oppositional threat to the established powers. Their worldview prevents them from seeing how disruptive and and subversive these counterexamples are. If the danger to to you comes when you adopt the oppositional mentality that the dominant culture encourages through, say, superhero movies. Once you have adopted that, you become a threat that they can see. But if you're working on a deeper level than they are conscious of, then you pose much less of an obvious threat. And sometimes you still might get sucked into the gears of the machine, but you make your you don't make yourself a target when you work at that level. So in a sense, it's sort of like a, a, there is a um, what do I want to say a um, continuity like th there's a purity to what you're saying because it, that also involves sort of sacrifice of individual identity, sort of humility. Like that if uh, if you're approaching these ideas without even the smallest yearning for individual glorification, that's a better approach to it do you you have to sacrifice the idea of you being a hero yeah that's a tough one isn't it i've always really liked that one that's one of uh -huh. my favorites um what about trials uh do you think that human beings have ever lived on this planet in accordance with some of the ideas that we are discussing and that the post-agricultural mindset is you know anathema or no i want to say anomaly an anomaly yeah, that you know that's not what I think, um, because agriculture emerged spontaneously from, in many places on Earth, separately, like independently. It emerged in China, it emerged in South America, Central America, uh, the Middle East, um, maybe a few other places, more or less at the same time, and without being transmitted from one place to another like a virus. What do you think that means? It means that it was built into the future already <laughs> during hunter-gatherer times. Well, that's an interesting bit of language. They were not. They were not static. I built mean, into the future already. Yeah. So basically, the. I mean, it certainly looks sometimes that agriculture was a gigantic mistake and an evil thing to impose domestication on the world and turn animals and plants to our purposes, but the transition from hunting hunting and gathering to agriculture was gradual 
and like you might have had nomadic groups settling for a season when the when the grains were coming ripe and then maybe protecting the grains a little bit and then or following herds kind of then, a good idea yeah protect these grains right they're easy, delicious right easy food you know so everything that we see as a problem emerged organically from what preceded it it wasn't a, a, a sudden rupture mm. some radicals think that that agriculture wasn't the big rupture it was symbolic culture naming oh my god like language was the problem but you could take it back even farther and say fire was the problem because that's how we first domesticated the wild and became masters of the world so seriously bloody prometheus yeah, like, are we going to say, okay, you know, we're going to repudiate fire so we can go back. <laughs> so I just have to trust that that all of this is part of a larger process that is beyond our comprehension. In which case, Charles, do, do that sort of, can, that can sometimes lead to a sort of abdication of responsibility. How do we ride that line knowing that it's unlikely that a solution to the problems of individualistic separation will emerge from some kind of individualistic mindset? And so part of, of, of um, sort of opposing that or resisting that or bypassing that is to let go of our individualistic worldview. But that sometimes makes me feel kind of passive, you know, like, that. well, what action are we taking what is the action and i bet that you know from more traditional activist communities what you get is a look can you just get on board and it reminds me a little mm -hmm. bit of a thing i read about these yogis chatting to bertrand russell who said to him what are you worried about like cnd and banning the bomb for you'll just invent and like unless you change the consciousness that created the bomb they'll just create more bombs and he went what am i do that <laughs> I mean, it's Bertram Russell, who's probably a bit more yeah. articulate, but that was basically his point was there are bombs. We've got to get shot off them. Yeah. You know, so when you're dealing on the level of consciousness, dealing with shifts in consciousness in this way, there is a sort of, you know, for something that is as radical as let's change the world and introduce new systems that are more representative of the truth of who we are at one symbiotically with ourselves and one another. You know, that's a sort of the introduction of that. It's hard to see how that could, wouldn't involve force, how it wouldn't involve conflict, how it wouldn't involve opposition. Yeah. So so I'm not I'm not offering these as alternatives to each other. Like I'm not saying uh, only work on the level of story and consciousness and don't work on the the superficial level of actual activism and actually changing things and actually stopping the pipeline and actually mm -hmm. no i'm saying that we need to be aware of all of the levels simultaneously to make sure that as we are trying to stop the pipeline we're not strengthening the underlying field that causes us to continue building pipelines yeah so so suppose we're dealing with immigration as an issue i know that that's a big one here in britain we're fuming. Yeah. So two sides. One side is, well, this is America, build a wall, but keep yeah. them out. And the other side is, that's inhumane. We That's racist. We need to uh, accommodate them. But which side is asking, where is immigration coming from? Why is it happening? Once you ask that question, the familiar positions no longer make sense because you understand that it is a neoliberal economic order that's making life so miserable, plus military imperialism, that's making life so miserable that people are willing to risk everything and uproot themselves to move to some new land. If you don't change that, then whether you build a wall or whether you let them in, you're gonna to continue to have this tension. So, This is yeah. This is an example of the need to to for our direct action to be informed by a deeper understanding of the of and it goes down level after level after level. So even, we we become love revolutionaries even when we're trying to, um, yeah, when we're trying to stop a bad thing from happening. And I'll just add one more thing, like just to repeat the point of. Sometimes force can be effective, but we're also facing a situation where we cannot win by force. If it comes to the point of, say, the military intervening to stop the revolution, what's going to stop them from succeeding? It'll be that some of the military have a change of heart. 
some of the generals, some of the soldiers, and they refuse to use their force. It's not that the people somehow get more guns in the military and overcome them. That's not the formula for change. Yes, and it sort of reminds me a little bit of some of the, like you said earlier on about monetary units that they're sort of held in consciousness and some apocryphal tale probably might have read it in one of your books for all I bloody know mm -hmm. about tulips becoming worthless just overnight when the Dutch economy yeah. was based on tulips that these uh seeming insurmountable sometimes you catch a glimpse of it there was a scandal in this country once where one of the was one of the newspaper groups was caught hacking the answer machine of a dead girl <laughs> sounds uh -huh. bad right <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds uh, <laughs> no sometimes you do need to hack a dead child's answer phone to get a really good news story um like um you know there was a way of they the journalists discovered that they could listen to answer phone messages by dialing a certain number right. so they dialed this and then the parents heard oh she's downloaded the messages she's not dead after all but oh my course, god yeah. yeah it's so awful and there was a moment there where you felt that public feeling sort of um, like a, the emotion I wonder is like a whip. There was sort mm -hmm. of like a vroom of public feeling. Uh, like, and uh, it kind of lashed that particular newspaper out of existence. However, that newspaper was underpinned right. by a conglomerate which was able to mutate and continue right. to exist. So, but there are sort of sometimes moments you can see where there you could harness a feeling and where something seemingly monolithic and insurmountable could just disappear because it, precisely because it is held in the consciousness of an individual serviced by primal energies you know if everybody suddenly went no more mcdonald's then no more mcdonald's if everybody suddenly said no more united kingdom or no more united states then that's the end of that idea it's held collectively in all of our consciousness and supported as i say by sort of primal energy sources such as fear or desire that continually wrangled and appointed mm -hmm. to particular constellations that mean that uh, it's difficult to disrupt that frequency. Sometimes naturally opportunities occur, which you sort of say could be regarded as miraculous information from mm -hmm. outside the paradigm as we understand it. I just can't understand how to do the so law. This is why it's so important to um, uh, propagate a deeper understanding of the causes and conditions of our system, because People could, you know, lash out against that newspaper and put that newspaper out of business. But are they changing the conditions that motivated them to do that in the first place? No. Not necessarily. Or people could tear down McDonald's and no more McDonald's. But are they changing the um, commodity agricultural system that that um, makes McDonald's viable? <laughs> no. So as our understanding goes deeper, the focus of our anger um goes more and more to basic causes rather than the superficial target that is offered to us as almost a sacrificial lamb mm. to prevent real change. And as our understanding gets deeper, our familiar solution set becomes inoperative. And this is an important stage. Otherwise, we get what happened in Egypt. What was it, five, seven years ago when the people won? Yes. They, they, the military put down their guns, the people won, and they did not know what to do except to invite the bureaucrats to continue, to invite some new people into power, to operate the same lever, level levers of power. And that after that revolution, even a year later, things were worse than before. Do you think that had you been in Egypt during that insurgency that you would have been able to say well do here's some ways of setting up systems of allocating resources of organizing communities that may be better than the Islamic I might have been able to say it but would people have listened without the experiences that make those solutions real to them so you are saying those solutions what I mean you know, I'm not an expert like you know there are people who think a lot about democracy direct democracy and, yeah. and these kind of things. I'm not an expert in that kind of stuff. I know they're out there. No one ever seems yeah. ready to go with that, do they? When the moment comes, whether it's Occupy Wall Street or the Arab Spring, and no one seems to be at the ground level with, you know, here's a solution. I, I don't think that this, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm suspicious of the people, well, a little bit suspicious of the whole idea that the solution can be produced by a smart person in a room somewhere and then because he's just so logical and he's got it all figured out. And okay, people, here's what you should do. I think that that is part of a process of discovery where maybe they do listen and say, okay, we will try that. And it totally doesn't work. But they not only learn 
about why it didn't work, but they also have an experience that maybe it worked for a glorious moment, like Occupy Wall Street, the, the, the whole consensus thing. In the end, it didn't really work, but it kind of did for a while. At least it gave a, um, an experience of what it is like for it to work. Yes, that's true. And yeah. perhaps like, uh, you know, the other cited, ex or not the other, but another example, like anarcho-syndicalism in the immediate mm -hmm. aftermath of this, right. you know, this prior to right. the Spanish Civil War. But like... Um, but again, in both these examples, they are working in opposition to a malevolent external yes. force that doesn't want it to succeed. You know? Right. And maybe that's why they only work for a brief moment. Yeah. It's like, so in Egypt, maybe if people had just been left alone, they would have worked right. something out. But maybe. there were other but, ideas that were ready to kick off. Right. And a whole global financial system that wanted them to get back in line. So, but, but you know, when we have these experiences, whether it is you know, the individual experience of communion or an experience in a group, in a community, they, they feed into the civilizational DNA. And eventually they, they change us into people and into a society that can really take on different systems when that moment of breakdown does come. Hmm. At least that's one narrative you could explore. These ideas are, 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 have been present for a long time, some of them, no? Like uh, sort of when I mean more essentially, like when you talk, when we talk briefly about humility, sacrifice of the individual, that uh, reality is an illusion. Like the, do you, these ideas can be found in, you know, Gnosticism and Buddhism mm -hmm. and in the Bhagavad Gita like it seems that there are so the same way as agriculture appeared simultaneously across cultures do you not think that there are spiritual doctrine not doctrines but scriptures that are, are trying to guide us towards here's a way of looking at reality that mm -hmm. might be better yes I, I'm, I'm I'm a little uncomfortable with with trying to make it into being okay sacrifice the individual and stuff it's just, it's much more about what is the next step that's offered to us why are you uncomfortable with that just because it seems like all or nothing and um it is an impossible task that we don't know how to do and it sets us up for kind of failure dynamics well you think that we are somewhat still infatuated with individualism or any individual is going to find it what, what does that mean sacrifice the individual? i think that we are um at a milestone or a landmark or a watershed that's a watershed um that we're on the verge of a, of a, a phase transition toward a larger conception and experience of self and that in that transition there are things different for each person but maybe with some commonalities there are things that it is time to surrender I'm not talking about all, you know, suddenly plunging into undifferentiated oneness. <laughs> I'm talking about what is the next step that's calling to us in our evolution as, as beings. It, it, so to fit it into some metaphysical doctrine of, well, no self or something like that, that's, to me, I mean, maybe those things are useful, but to me, that's kind of a diversion from the encounter with that thing that I'm ready to surrender, that I'm, that's still kind of precious to me. But what do you might mean that? What would you mean by that? Like something like it might be lust or grandeur. It would be more like grandeur. Um, so for me, it might be, um, you know, uh, a public image. Yeah, like I want a nice public image. Yeah, like like, 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 and it's like what. Am, as I become clearer about what I serve, I realize that sometimes I'm serving two things. Um, I'm serving a more beautiful world, and I'm also serving an image of being a nice guy. Oh, yeah. Or I'm serving getting approval from certain people. I like the approval. Yeah. And and so at some point, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of done with that part. And then... And that will come at a time when my service to what I'm really serving requires that I be done with that part. 
do you reckon that formula I described will work for that? Say you're sort of thinking, you know, uh, approval. Say you wanted to let go of approval. Yeah. Do you think the model of um, I want to change this is a problem? It's possible to change this. There is hope. Free, I'm willing to ask for help. Do you think that, mm -hmm. that does that formula make sense to you as a model for transition? I think it's um, I don't know. Like maybe you have more experience with this than I do. Um, my gut feeling is that it's more of a description than a formula. What's the difference? Well, a formula might be something that okay, I'm like here's a series of steps, right? A formula. First, you do this, then you do that, then you do that. Mm. But it might be something that is a description of what happens in this process I see. and that the cause of it is something else. Yes, you're right. The cause yeah. is unquantifiable. Yeah, but it, it is a description, but it's a description, a sort of a more, a, a pre-seed description of a, like there is, a, there are steps. It's like, why? For, like here are some examples of why looking for approval is made mm -hmm. you feel bad about yourself. Oh yeah, I wanted approval from this person. I didn't get it. Right, remember that Yeah. <laughs> too. Like here's some people that don't seem to need approval. Okay, that's possible. Three, next time you want approval, recognize it and then ask someone who you admire, who seemingly doesn't. Like, you know, that, so that's how mm -hmm. it becomes more formulaic, although it can never be rational and material because I guess on some level we are interfacing with some component that's difficult, to impossible to quantify. Yeah, there's a big mystery underneath all this. Yeah, what the fuck is going on, Charles? <sighs> Don't ask me. <laughs> That's what we've been doing for the last hour and uh, 15 minutes. Charles, the last few minutes, um, Jenny, who I work with, has been holding up signs that say things like, Charles's cab is here in 10 minutes. Okay. You have a call to make in five minutes, so we will have to conclude this episode of Under the Skin. I've enjoyed speaking to you very much. I hope we get further opportunities to communicate and perhaps illustrate more deeply what it is we're discussing and maybe chances even to experiment with these ideas. What do you think? Yeah, I would like that. Me too. All right, nice one. I did that sort of like, that was like a sort of a, a, a bond at the end, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gift exchange. Thank you, mate. Thanks for watching this podcast and going all the way to the end of it. It was usually kind of to click the bell. It might not be there, because over there. And uh, subscribing so that we can infiltrate your serenity and peace of mind with jangling bells and buzzes. Thank you.